as I climb down the ladder. And I just close my eyes and start visualizing myself climbing down the ladder, and I get to the bottom rung, I sort of spiral backwards. I kind of just dive backwards, and each and then each circle gets bigger and bigger, a little slower and slower, and eventually I just kind of drift off, and the next thing I know, I open my eyes, and it could be five minutes or five hours later. Whatever was coming through was a, was a master, absolute master of manipulation. Um, they, they or it knew something. I allow it to occur, and I can feel the energy coming around me. It's sort of like, not like sticking your finger in a wall socket, but something less than that, and you feel it in you. You know it's present. How do you know who you're talking to? That's one of the questions I ask these people. How, how can you really be sure of the identity of this entity? That ought to frighten you. Maybe they're misrepresenting themselves. They've got no ID. If you put their statements under a microscope, you'll find, especially the ones about past life, you find out that something is wrong here, that the picture is not complete. Without a doubt, if it is for real, you'll be opening up doors that are meant to remain closed, just like I did, and eventually, you'll have spirit entities controlling you. They say that there's like not a lot of difference in some ways. Actually, they're talking to me about it right now. Um, It is called channeling, where the physical body is only the vehicle. The vocal cords resound with non-physical voices. The phenomenon is widespread. There are thousands of channelers in North America alone, and millions of adherents come from all walks of life seeking the wisdom of the so-called spirit guides. Who are these voices? Extraterrestrials? Ascended masters? Highly evolved spirit beings? These are just some of their claims. It will laugh. It will laugh. The practice itself is difficult for any of us to accept at face value. Is the supernatural interacting with the natural? Are spirits really in contact with humans? If so, who are the voices making the claims and providing the information? With the Edgar Cayce style, deep trance style, um, there came through a group of guides, numbering in the thousands, several thousands, and it, in time they gave their name and they call themselves Starfleet. They have told me that they are extraterrestrial intelligences from another star system. I guess is the closest thing you could say, and yet they're also multidimensional beings. Even though they do have physical forms, they're not quite the same as ours are. And um, there are others too that I've seen that are extraterrestrial, that look different from them, but they seem to work together. Another channeler, Pat Rodegast, channels a spirit called Emmanuel. In her book simply called Emmanuel's Book, Rada Gass describes her first encounter. The first time I saw Emmanuel, he appeared as he still does, as a being of golden light. Steve White channels a group of entities who take on yet a different form. I channel several different beings. There are beings that are termed the spiritual hierarchy and the Ashtar Command. Um... All of a sudden, everybody goes, ooh, the Ashtar Command, UFOs and stuff. But the Ashtar Command, they're etheric beings. They're not in a physical embodiment like we have. And as one evolves from, let's say, the third dimensional plane to others, they can choose different aspects of service. And the Ashtar Command are ascended masters who have chosen to be in service to different planets going through transition. Asheron's about eight feet tall. He's slim, but very powerful. His main emanation seems to be in the blue range, the blues, the violets, the purples. 
actually I called him Blue for many years because I couldn't hear his name. Even Ageron is only a very small portion of his real name because their names are comprised of all their experience and all their knowledge and we just don't have the vocal cords or the comprehension to be able to say their whole name. So they've given me little bits of their names. The expertless experts. Jacques Purcell is internationally renowned. He channels Lazarus, a non-physical entity whose teachings have influenced the lives of thousands of people through public lectures, video and audio tapes, and personal consultation. Who is he? That's, that's a good question. He's never been physical, and, and he's never had a body form. That, that disturbs some people because they assume, because I'm physical and because you're physical, everybody in the universe has been physical and have all been here on Earth or whatever. We're starting to accept the idea that maybe there are life forms that are other than on Earth, and uh, maybe eventually we can accept the idea that there are life forms that don't have bodies either. And he's one of those. He's, he refers to himself as a, a consciousness, an intelligence, a spark of love, a spark of light without form. And that's probably the best description of, of what he is. Uh, who he is is just this incredible loving energy that uh, seems to be here to not save us and not do for us, but to befriend us and help us do for ourselves. It's nothing mysterious. Uh, I don't know if it would work for everybody, you know, but it seems to work for me, and that is I climb down a ladder. I just close my eyes and start visualizing myself climbing down a ladder, and when I get to the bottom rung, I sort of spiral backwards. I kind of just dive backwards, and, each, and then each circle gets bigger and bigger, a little slower and slower, and eventually I just kind of drift off, and the next thing I know, I open my eyes, and it could be five minutes or five hours later, and... Uh, I know something must have happened because I always feel good afterwards. So uh, that's how I do it. And, and uh, yeah, I've done it now for uh, as many as 10 or 12 times a day, for, for, or once a day at least, for 13 years now. I relax and I developed my own relaxation technique, which everyone would find for themselves to be unique. Um, I relax. I raise my vibrational frequency by bringing my thoughts to thankfulness and joy and love and such higher thought form frequencies as well as I visualize moving into a, a lighter and more refined vibration of existence. It's, uh, so I imagine light and refined feeling. And from there, uh, I connect with my source, and this source I allow to blend with my energy. Of course, I, I'm familiar with this source, and um, I feel like uh, I fill up with golden light. I feel like I'm filling, filling up with golden light, and it's grounded right down to my feet, and they just start speaking from there. They speak through me. I step aside. And because I step aside, that is why I go into a trance state. I just step aside. I just get out of the way. And it's possible that um, I can main portion of my energy body steps aside leaving the portion that keeps the heart going and the lungs going and everything there. And then that part of Ageron or whoever is speaking will come in and utilize my form. That area of the spiritual realm that reached down to humankind, call them angelic beings, extraterrestrials, whatever, uh, that reach down, they are available for us to channel from, to reach to help guide our lives, to help us make this a better place so that we are more about the divine plan down here, the plan that was originally brought into being when life was brought about. And you can reach that realm and be guided to them by meditating. There was a natural talent who didn't really know anything about me except I was a psychic. She doesn't know anything about channeling. She doesn't know from extraterrestrials. and. At some point, um, we were kind of like doing a meditation together, and suddenly she looked at me and she said, you seem to have a veil all around you. 
And she continued looking. She says, no, it's not a veil. It's like a shower of light. And she starts looking up. And she goes, oh, my God. I say, what do you see? She proceeded to describe the three to me. She says, it's like they're in some sort of spaceship. But, of course, it's not a spaceship. <laughs> she, she didn't want to, um, I'm sure, appear that she was, like, seeing things. And she says, there's these three beings. Each of them have a different thing they're supposed to do, but they do it together. And she's just looking up. And she says, and they seem to be different colors. Now, she didn't know anything about this, about me. In Hungry Ghosts, investigative journalist Joe Fisher examines the phenomenon of channeling and the spirit world. He discusses the origins. Well, the earliest recorded information that we have is really with the ancient Greeks and the Greek oracles when priestesses would be dressed in white and would go into a trance and bring through voices and prophecies to the assembled gathering. Um, channeling has been known by a number of different names in different cultures over the, over the centuries. But it, it next rears its head in a major way with the Victorians in the last century. Alexander Blair Ewart, editor of Dimensions magazine, has studied the resurgence of channeling and its pagan beginnings. Trans channeling basically emerged in the mid 1800s when science had destroyed Western religion, essentially something that had been repressed for about 2,000 years, which was paganism, and earlier atavistic forms of religion came gushing to the surface. So suddenly you had this um, uh, pagan approach to the spirit that had been repressed for a couple of thousand years, and it suddenly floated to the surface. When mediums would sit in a seance and, and uh, sit among people who came into this seance room to listen to the words of the entities who were speaking through the medium. And, the, and these entities were often Chinese and Red Indian guides. Why they prevailed, we don't know, but often the guides who spoke through, and, and I, I use the word guides uh, in quotes, the, the, the entities who, who came through uh, were often Red Indian and, and, and Chinese and would, give, uh, would make pronouncements about the lives of the citizens in that room, would tell them much about themselves, would be able to speak clairvoyantly about the people who are gathered around the medium. And the medium would be insensible, would be often sitting back uh, with uh, their eyes closed and would just pronounce in, in a monotone voices. And the voices would often change as different entities would come through. It seems that mostly people are using channeling at this stage in less of a 19th century way where you went to get a message from your Auntie Mary who, you know, passed over 10 years ago and where the messages were very uh, much in terms of uh, the medium coming through and saying, I've got your Auntie Mary here and here's some advice. Um, now people seem to be um, drawing on channeling from the point of view of saying, um, which is why, ultimately, I don't think channeling is dangerous, because the way that the individual interacts with it is, and I've done a lot of research, talked to hundreds and hundreds of people, they tend to say, well, I get this kind of information from the channeled entity. I take from it what I want to use. I take from it what I feel comfortable with, and I try to develop myself spiritually through that. I think that channeling is part of the end result of, of the me generation. It's people looking to see how much they can personalize themselves, how much they can get into their own things, how much they can, uh, well, get their own goodies, and here's another goodie they can get. But that's only a small part of it. I think a large part of it is that you're finding in our society today a tremendous fear and anxiety and a need for some kind of authority which will give people direction. What... Uh has drawn me to channeling is that in religious structures they're, they're precisely that they're a structure and if you're looking for a sense of security and conformity then you go and you find their answers but channeling is a way that helps you find your own answers and it makes your life 
far more meaningful. You're not dependent on someone to tell you who you are, what you should do. We are a culture which is now what I would call rejecting many of the assumptions that we've lived with for the past 300 years. For example, the assumption that um, the rational is the only way of knowing truth. And so you have that being in some ways pushed aside and people saying, no, that there are many other ways of finding truth. And one of those ways of finding truth is to connect with another reality, a spirit reality or a spiritual reality. And so there's a searching after that. Traditional religion never did it for me. Um, external authority never did it for me. I always felt there was something inside there that needed to come up to the surface. So I studied altered states of consciousness. One day a friend was leading me through a meditation and I sensed an energy in the room. And to make a long story short, the energy was very loving, very benevolent, and I got a sense that it wanted to drop in to my body. And this is really an introduction of what we would call a neo-paganism. It's, 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 a, it's a reintroduction into the West of beliefs that have been around for thousands upon thousands of years that there are in fact spiritual entities and spiritual realities both in nature and outside of nature and we can contact them. So I think all of that comes together at a time when people are very insecure, they're searching for direction, they want answers, they want certainty, but they feel all the old ways of giving answers are, are not appropriate. And so there are certain groups of people who are now wanting to tune in to uh, spirits that can give them help and can give them direction. Joe Fisher had researched metaphysics for many years before encountering the world of channeling. In his book, Fisher tells how he was invited to the home of a woman he calls Aviva, who claimed that there were entities from another dimension speaking through her. A small group of people gathered weekly to witness the various voices who would take control of Aviva. Well, I was so impressed with the, 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 the accents, the, the personalities, the, the different languages that were produced by Aviva in her trance state that I said to my friends, uh, and um, among them several journalists, you've got to see this, you've got to come to this house and witness this for yourself, which they did. And the group, uh, by me introducing people, by these other people also introducing other people, the group swelled to about, to close to 30 at its peak. He phoned up and said, uh, you know, I've found this group that meets on Friday night and, you know, you've, uh, it's just great and you've got to come and, uh, and, uh, and see what's happening. And, I think, uh, you know, the intimation was that this was almost a secret society. And so you can imagine, there was Aviva lying down uh, on her Chesterfield with her little pink slippers pointed towards the ceiling, going into trance, and she would switch from one voice to another, that is, different guide, so-called guide, speaking through her, as each different person in the room would speak, and they would go around the room Different, and they would never introduce themselves. A voice would come out and immediately the voice, the voice that she was producing would change in accordance with the voice that asked the question. And, and all of these, these entities, these beings, were what we would call inside of her physical body. Um, we would see a lot of changes that would, would take over. It wasn't just the voices, but in being re relatively close to her as these beings were coming through. I could see the, the difference, I could see the characteristics of, of these, these entities as, as they came through. Her body, uh, and, and particularly her face, would, and that would change. Her eyes were closed, she couldn't see this. It was all done, I don't know how it was done. To this day I have many questions about just what was going on. But all I know is that Laurence Olivier on his finest day at the Old Vic could never have produced this array of different inflections and voices and languages um, within a space of an hour. Each one of us had, uh, had a major, major guide, like Russell was um, her guide and Tuktu was mine. And I spoke to the entity that came forward, Russell Parnick, and he, he described himself as a, as a sheep farmer from the last century, that was his last, last incarnation and he proceeded to tell me that I had a guide too who was looking after me on, on the earthbound plane, or rather the guide was in the disembodied realm. And her name was Philippa, she was Greek, that her and I had been together 
in Greece in the 18th century, and it was now her responsibility in this other realm to oversee my spiritual development while I was on Earth. Fisher was intrigued by the entity claiming to be Philippa, his spirit guide. While it was speaking through Aviva, he taped the voice and took it to a linguistic specialist at the University of Toronto to verify its authenticity. Uh, this man's name is Dr. George Thaniel, and he's a native-born Greek himself. So I thought the perfect, you know, the linguistics professor who is a Greek by birth. He listened to two tapes of Philippa speaking, and he said, in part, this is a native-born Greek woman speaking. So I thought, well, there is proof that Aviva is not concocting this. She hasn't just been to the library, read some Greek, and then is making it up for me. Um, and even if she were to learn Greek, she would be unable to speak with the voice of a native-born Greek. With such impressive evidence, Fisher embarked on a journey to validate the claims of the guides. Had they lived previous lives? Joe, uh, Joe's involvement and, and that uh, became quite enhanced. He ha had, uh, had decided at that point that this was something unique and marvelous and that he was going to write a book on um, on channeling and uh, and and bring out all of this wonderful information that we were given and actually go and and source these various entities uh, i mean you have to realize that there was 25 or 30 people in this time had been involved and each one of them had guides and each each one of these guides had had lifetimes and backgrounds and he was going to find Russell, proof of russell's existence and proof of his guides existence and that was going to be part of the uh, of the book and that was going to substantiate this wonderful information. Fisher's first trip took him to England, where Aviva's spirit guide, Russell Parnick, claimed to have lived as an 18th century sheep farmer. If you spoke about living near the village of Heathfield in Yorkshire, and the village, I went, I visited it, it was there just as he had described, just a few houses and a, a little church, this sort of thing. And uh, he, uh, Russell spoke about a... Uh, a dru the Druid's stones nearby, which were half a day's ride away on horseback, uh, you know, touchingly evoked in last century language, and that was there just as he said. He said he had a 22-acre farm. I wasn't able to find the farm, but he said that the farm abutted onto the Burn Gill, which was a little stream that ran into the larger Nitherdale River, and the stream and the river were there. However, when I came to the litmus test again of finding Russell Parnick, I searched high and low in the records, in the church records, in the government records. He was nowhere to be found. Another guide, Ernest, claimed to have been a bomber pilot with the Royal Air Force in 99 Squadron in World War II. Once again, Fisher went to great lengths to prove this claim, even interviewing surviving members of the squadron, only to leave disappointed. Now, most of the historical and, ge and geographical information he had provided was accurate, was there. There's only one problem. Ernest, the bomber pilot, did not exist. I couldn't find him in the records. So I came back to Toronto, and uh, I told him I was much impressed with the, the fact that I, all this information was there. There was just this one problem that I couldn't find him. Then he went into a great song and dance about karma, how he has a charge sitting in this room who his, he, he must look after. And he had realized too late that the information he was giving me might be detrimental to the welfare of his charge who's on the earthbound plane. And he had decided, he said, to change the information, to backtrack. Now, I argued with him at great length. I said, you could have told me this before I left if you'd felt this. And even so, uh, you started off by giving me your name before you had this change of, change of mind. And the name that I was looking for was just not in the records. And he weaseled and whined and, and, and in, invoked the higher laws. So he got out of it. But the question remained with me. Was Ernest telling the truth? Was he not? I will have to check out other guides to find out whether this is true or not. The obvious choice of guides to investigate was his own Philippa, whom he had come to trust as a result of his personal effort to make contact. You see, initially, Philippa encouraged me to contact her, and that she said that, that rather than just go through a medium, the, most, the best way to contact your guide was directly. And she said that if I concentrated on her every day for 15 minutes or more, that I would be able to make this contact after, after a period of time. And, uh, and so every morning I would go up to my study, and I would train myself, my mind, 
on making contact with her. Nothing happened for weeks and weeks and weeks, but eventually an image of a woman walking towards me in a white wrap was presented to my inner vision. And I was convinced that this was Philippa, and I, my response was to weep, and I, I cried for several minutes. And again, when I went back to the group, Philippa, I, I didn't have to say anything. Philippa said, you see, we have made contact. And again, this is another one of the bricks in the wall. So he said, well, yeah, he was going to go off and, uh, and, and, and his, his guide, who loved him dearly and certainly would not um, deceive him, um, had given him all this information and he had maps and research and he was going to go and, and, and find her. He couldn't find Russell, you know, uh, r the, the entity known as Russell had never been born in that parish or lived in that place, but enough of it fitted. I mean, he knew the general area, same as, as Ernest knew about um, World War II bombers and, and things like that. But Joe knew that, he, that uh, he could never be deceived by his guide. Now, I then went to Greece looking for Philippa, and a similar thing happened. I was looking for the village of Theros, which she had said was only five days' walk away from the Black Sea, again, touchingly evoked in the old ancient language, which made me believe her initially. I went to the town of Alexandropolis in uh, north what is it, eastern, northeastern Greece. And it was there that the, 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 that the edifice on which her testimony was based on, which was already crumbling because of the, 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 the failure of, of, the, of her colleagues to, to pan out, uh, I, was, I had expected Alexandropolis to be an ancient city based on Alexander the Great. And when I went there, I found that it, that it, it wasn't, and that, in fact, that Alexandropolis was only built... I think it was at the beginning of this century, the, the end of the last century, and Philippa was talking about it having existed in her day, and this could not have been. So I, I carried on my search there, looking for more clues to her existence, but Philippa, even though her Greek had been uh, veridical, uh, Philippa too went the same way, and it was a wrenching disillusionment for me. Mike Mandel is a Canadian entertainer and lecturer. For many years, he was involved in various aspects of the occult, including spirit mediumship. Dozens of entities would speak through him on an ongoing basis. I became involved in what is now known as channeling in the late 1960s. It was a spontaneous experience. We had been trying astral travel and a group of other techniques to let our spirits leave our bodies, to develop clairvoyant abilities, and so on. And when I say we, I mean a small group of us that had polarized together around an occult worldview. By trying these different techniques, I inadvertently opened myself up and various entities began speaking through me, initially speaking in my head, and then eventually taking over to such a degree they were using my vocal cords and speaking through me to our friends. Mike would literally, could literally be talking to you as I'm talking to you now, and instantly, um, in a moment, change and be taken over and someone else would be talking. And his voice would literally stop being Mike and all of a sudden be somebody else. Initially, it seemed to take them quite a bit of effort to take control of me. And it was more or less a voluntary thing. But as time passed, I realized that it was getting much, much easier for them to slip in and out. We used to call it someone popping in. We'd say, oh, so-and-so just popped in when you were gone. And they would appear sometimes for hours, sometimes for just a few minutes. And then we realized eventually that they were able to go in and out as they pleased by the end of things. In, and we asked one of the entities, someone asked on my behalf and said, why is it that you can get in and out of Mike's personality so readily? And they said something to the effect of, all human beings have a door that will keep other spirit beings out. And in most people's cases, the door is locked and barred and stapled shut and roped shut and sealed. And they said in my case, it was virtually hanging off the hinges. They claimed to be uh, distinctive entities. In other words, if the if they had a name, they would say their name. If they had a purpose or a, a distinctive, they would tell you that. Uh, in in many cases, but the the range would range from very what we call low level life forms that really didn't seem to have any purpose except to be pranksters, that sort of thing, uh, on up to uh, through the through the sort of human range, right on up to the what you call ascended masters, the the wise, benevolent, powerful type uh, entities, and the antithesis of that, the evil, um, powerful, um, intelligent 
uh, entities as well. They claim to be ascended masters, um, highly advanced spirit beings even on other planets, people on various astral planes who had reincarnated and then gone on to perfection, uh, Tibetan Buddhists, people from the past. I mean, there was an entire realm of things that they called themselves. However, the common thread was they were all spiritually pure and were contacting our little group specifically to help us evolve spiritually. Warrior often witnessed strange occurrences. He feared the darker controlling entities, one of whom regularly threatened him with knives. Still, he was fascinated by the spirit's powers. Uh, one evening when I was over at Mike's place, we were uh, just sitting talking when all of a sudden a, one of the entities popped in and became visibly angry with, I think, primarily myself and um, began ranting and raving. I can't remember the exact words he was saying, but he, he got up and sort of stormed off into the kitchen. My habit being that to always follow Mike into the kitchen or anywhere where there were knives present. And so I just followed, but I was very concerned with what was going on. Uh, as I got to the doorway of the kitchen, uh, Mike, quote, Mike was standing and had picked up two Coke bottles off the counter, two 26-ounce Coke bottles, and held them both out in front of him and crushed them simultaneously, one in each hand. Uh, then, unfortunately, Mike, the entity left, and Mike was not able to come back right away. And in that delay time, uh, Mike fell forward into the broken glass, uh, cutting his, I don't know if his hands were cut at that moment or when he actually crushed the bottles, but they were cut fairly badly. Um, he was obviously in shock when he came when he came back. I got him up, moved him to the, to the couch in the living room, uh, and again he was taken over this time by another entity which seemed much gentler, more benevolent, and held out his hands in a very almost pathetic sort of way and said, "Do the wounds on my hands seem familiar to you?" And now we had an entity who was claiming to be or imitating Christ. One of the things the entities used to do was they used to test us. It was as though we were being brainwashed. We'd be told to do something very bizarre immediately. Or we'd be told to go at midnight to this certain forest that was very, very terrifying to us because there'd been a number of manifestations there. We'd be told to go alone there at midnight and stay there for an hour and then come home. And they were testing our readiness to respond immediately to their commands. And we were not to test them ever because they always said proof comes to those who do not ask for it, which sounds vaguely biblical, but it isn't. And I recall one time, one of the entities was put to the test. One of the particular people in the group suddenly spoke to it in German. And the entity, without missing a beat, stopped its sentence with the other person, turned and addressed him in flawless German, and then turned back and continued the conversation. Well, none of us knew German. None of us had studied it at any time. But the entity was able to switch in and out of the other language immediately. This was something that nobody was supposed to know. And uh, was, we couldn't tell anybody at all. But the, the big thing was she was dying of, um, of leukemia and, and that. And as, just as, as this remarkable coincidence, you know, the hand of fate, the intervention of God in the universe, that I was the only person that could help her. And if I didn't do this, she was going to die. The guides told him that he was the only member of the group who had healing powers that could be used to help Aviva recover from her leukemia. They brought him in, they brought him closer to Aviva, they then advised the, the previous hypnotist that his time was up and that Sanford should be looking after her in her trance state and uh, that Sanford could do the healing and that's why he should become the leader of the group. So this is what happened, and Sanford, in giving the healing, being instructed by the guides to place his hands on Aviva's body, and he, he would feel through his fingers great sensations of cold or heat, depending on the instructions the guides were giving him. I could actually feel these energies flowing, and, uh, and feel the, re, you know, the results of them, and you know, it, it would take a, a long time to describe, but there were many different physical manifestations of, of this. If Aviva had a, a, a serious pain problem with her leukemia, she would call Sanford, he'd come rushing down, talk her into trance, administer the healing, bring her back, and then he would talk to Russell, the main guide, and Russell would say, great job, Sanford, you know. 
Without you, we couldn't, we couldn't carry on. What, what was actually happening was that, uh, that I was getting, suffering some real physical and mental and emotional problems because of all of the, not only demands, but also because of all this energy that was going through. And only after the fact, when I broke clean and, and, and got a, away from it, did I realize that they were doing it. They were creating this dependency. I would have to go and, and, and not only heal her, but put her down and, and ask them, being Russell and, uh, and, and Tuck too, who was supposedly my guide, to channel energies through me to um, sort of balance my energies or, or fix me, because I, would, I was getting right weird. You know, these strange energies were flowing through me, and I was, I was having hallucinations and, and all kinds of physical problems. And, geez, these guys were really great, you know, about ten minutes with them flowing energy through me, and I was fine. I was like an addict that just had a hit, you know. I was great. I just fell on top of the world. It was only afterwards I realized they were doing it. They were creating it. They were creating the dependency. And so he found that he was like a psychic drug, drug addict. He would be going to Aviva not only to help her restore her health, but in fact to pump up his own flagging energies. It was only when he pulled away that he began to realize, hey, you know, I feel better. And I, he said he realized that he felt better because he was no longer under their sphere of influence. Sanford Allison went into channeling with no background training in metaphysics or meditation or in the use of higher mind or in the use of um, discrimination. It appears that the entity was well aware of that. But Sanford Ellison did not lack training. As a practicing psychic, he had much experience in the realm of metaphysics. However, this training did not prove to be a safeguard. I was really what you would call over the, over the edge. Uh, I was not rational um, throughout that time, and, it, and it, was, it got to that point. I was totally dependent on, on, on them, whoever they were. And uh, outside of that, I, I was just subject to illusions and delusions and forces that uh, I had no understanding of. Famous mystic Emanuel Swedenborg spent an entire lifetime associating with the spirit world. Yet he warned, when the spirits begin to speak with a man, he ought to beware that he believes nothing whatever from them, for they say almost anything. Things are fabricated by them, and they lie. They would tell so many lies, and indeed, with solemn affirmation that a man would be astonished. If a man listens and believes, they press on, and deceive and seduce in many ways. I don't know what Ekton is. That's why I call him a non-physical personality. In my own meditations, I've met some personalities that are a little, little shady, you know, but nothing that I would consider uh, demonic in a traditional religious sense. And the problem with mediumship is, perhaps the greatest common denominator, is it's very unnatural for people to turn over their personal sovereignty to another entity. When they do this, they don't know what they're picking up, they don't know who's speaking through them, there's no way that they can test who this, what this voice is, what its source is. And as I've said, that usually, perhaps, you know, 99% of the time, if not more, that voice is there as a parasite, no more. Author Dave Hunt, in his book, America, The Sorcerer's New Apprentice, examines channeling. Carl Jung, in his time, he said, no, these are depths of the psyche, but he came to believe that these are spirit beings. You can't escape it before his death. And he came to believe maybe, hey, maybe they may not all be good. Maybe some of them are, are evil. Uh, so there are people who would say it's the wisdom of the universe, the ancient wisdom. Edgar Mitchell, uh, one of our astronauts uh, at the Institute of Nordic Sciences, which he founded, uh, he would say that sort of thing. It's the ancient wisdom uh, that... Oh, when you were back um, in, in Greek days, you know, they consulted the oracle at Delphi. And there's some kind of a, a mysterious 
uh, wisdom that's just built into our genes, into the collective consciousness or psyche of the human race. Others would say, no, these are um, uh, ascended masters. Elizabeth Clare Prophet, uh, who claims to channel Jesus and Buddha and so forth, she would, she would say that. Others would say they're, well, it used to be popular to say these are the spirits of the dead. There are a variety of explanations for this. Um, I ha my research indicates they're demons. While researching mediumship, Western psychologist William James stated, the refusal of modern enlightenment to treat possession as a hypothesis to be spoken of as even possible, in spite of the massive human experience in its favor, has always seemed to me a curious example of the power of fashion in things scientific. That the demon theory will have its innings again is to my mind absolutely certain. One has to be scientific indeed to be blind and ignorant enough to suspect no such possibility. Well, they claim to be ascended masters, but in reality they were the exact opposite end of the spiritual scale. Uh, there's no question in my mind now that they were demon spirits. If you had asked me then, I would have believed entirely that they were higher beings, a higher spiritual order of beings. I wouldn't have believed in demons. I didn't think they existed. I thought they were an invention of the Christian church. In retrospect now, I can see back with horrible clarity that they were malevolent, created, demonic spirits intent on our destruction. Some of these entities out here will say, oh yeah, they're bad spirits uh, and they're good spirits. In fact, um, uh, the old mediums uh, before the channelers came along, it was a little more complicated. And the mediums would have a control. It was called a control spirit. And the control function, the function of the control spirit was to keep the bad spirits away uh, and to kind of line things up, you know, and make it work out uh, as it should. And they would even say, oh, that was a lower entity. In my own case, I recall that some of the entities we had to deal with were overtly violent, almost psychotic. And the others were pure and altruistic, and all they wanted to do was help us, and they would warn us about things that the nasty entities were doing, and they would give us teaching and methods of developing ourselves and so on. In retrospect, I'd like to say that all the entities were equally evil. It was the clever way it was presented by showing this group as overtly evil that made us more ready to accept these guys as the good guys. In reality, they were all in it together. In evaluating the situation, the reason they appeared to be good or evil was to create a contrast and also to create uh, further deception. You know, it was obviously that the whole thing was it was an, it was an incredible deception, but uh, it would have had no credibility if it was obvious as a deception. Obviously what spirits do is warp people's perception of what reality is about. And I think one of the difficult things is that you are really dealing with people who are being duped is the best word I could say. And in that handing over of themselves to this power, in that handing over, they're going to see that as good stuff and not see that they are moving towards some very destructive things for themselves and for others. Biblical writers of both Old and New Testament have much to say about the continuous attempt by Satan and evil spirits or demons to deceive the human race. Moses wrote of Satan's enticement and deception of Eve in the Garden of Eden, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Ramtha, channeled by Jay-Z Knight, has stated, what is termed God is within your being, and that which is called Christ is within your being. And when you know you are God, you will find joy. Helen Shookman, who claims to channel Jesus, states in her work entitled A Course in Miracles, God's name is holy, but no holier than yours. To call upon his name is but to call upon your own. You are the holy son of God himself. Helen Shookman who was a psychologist at Columbia University and kept hearing this voice that said, this is a course in miracles, take it down. This is a course in miracles, take it down. She didn't want to take it down. She was an atheist. She didn't believe in this other dimension. And she consulted her fellow psychologists and they said, well, go ahead. And so she took it down, 1,100 pages 
uh, A Course in Miracles, which claim to come from Jesus, but which, in fact, undermined everything Jesus said. <laughs> it's the age-old battle between good and evil. The, the Bible will tell you that the, the devil will, will come in many forms. And in a sense, these beings are uh, 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 an aspect of that side of nature, the dark side. And uh, therefore, they don't like mention of Christ. They, they, will, they, will, uh, they won't come out usually and say Christ is bad. They will subtly put Christ down. He, they will say that Christ wasn't really a truly historic figure, that his deeds have been magnified over the years. All people who are channeling entities, whatever they say they are, Jesus Christ, Buddha, your Aunt Vera, whoever, they're not these pure, altruistic, beautiful beings that they seem to be. If you strip away the covering, you'll find a demon behind every one of these voices, behind every one of the spirits. In fact, one of their most clever ploys is to appear, as the Bible says, even Satan disguises as an angel of light. We're seeing these emissaries of evil that are dressing in the most wonderful packaging, so people are accepting them as genuine. People are seeing them as good and pure. And in reality, even the good ones are demon spirits. Very clever and subtle manipulation. St. Paul wrote, Some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Proponents of channeling claim the identity of the spirits is unimportant. Information is all that matters. Truth is subjective. If it sounds right, accept it. Biblical writers warn that these unseen entities are in fact evil spirits, and the people who succumb to their teachings are ultimately deceived. Who are the voices behind this phenomenon? Who goes there?